I was actually surprised myself. Now, I am a late night snacker, but I thought I was a, a bit of a freak out there snacking so late. Welcome to Live Well, Be Well, a show to help high performers improve their health and well-being. I'm shocked from what I've read on your research. I don't actually need to change my diet, but I more so need to change how I eat, which will have a bigger effect on my health outcomes. So can you explain this to me, that how I eat can considerably change the effect of my health outcomes? How and why do we do this? Okay, so we now know that there's lots of uh, reasons as to how food impacts our health. We know that the food itself is important. We know that our biology is important. You know, our gut microbiome, our age, our sex, whether we're pre or postmenopausal. But what we also know is how we eat that food actually is really important, and how we eat that food can modulate the health impacts of that food, of those ingredients, of those different nutrients. And by how we, what I mean are factors like eating rate to how fast we eat our foods. I mean eating windows. So the time period in which we have our first to our last meal. So therefore how long our fasting period is. I also mean things like eating frequency. So the number of times we eat throughout the day, the number of snacks we have. Also how much sleep we've had. So these other kind of pillars of health can impact our health as well. And so there's lots of different ways as to how we eat can impact our health and also factors like meal ordering as well. So what you have for breakfast can actually impact how you respond to your lunch meal. And so just changing your breakfast can change your response to your lunch meal as well. It's such an interesting way to start to look at this because we can get so bogged down in what we're eating, how much we're eating, you know, the conversation around calories. So even just thinking, if we actually just take that information and move that to a side for one minute and actually just look, as you said, all of these different points on how we're eating. So eating speed, the order that we eat our foods, the timing that we eat our foods. So let's start from the top to see how we can start doing this. So how does the eating speed impact our health? Yeah, so Sarah, I think it's really important to caveat this, as I always like to remember, I'm a a boring (laughs) scientist, there is no silver bullet. And I'm afraid I can't give everyone the sexy answer that, you know, one simple change is going to revolutionise their life. That I'm not saying that what you eat doesn't matter. So I'm not saying, hey, everyone go and eat KFC, McDonald's every day, but just change the time that you're eating it. Mm -hmm. What I want to really make clear is that in addition to a healthy, balanced diet, there's all of these other strategies that can actually have a really big impact. And so rather than over-focusing sometimes on minutia in terms of changing this particular food and that particular food, actually there's other tools in our toolbox that can really improve Mm -hmm. our health. And they're often really simple to do. So, yep, let's dive straight into eating rate. This is something I've become really interested in uh, just over the last six months. It's something that we don't talk about either. And so if I was to ask you, how quickly did you eat your breakfast today? You probably probably didn't even think about it. (laughs) I didn't even eat breakfast. But when I do eat, I'm definitely someone who needs to slow down my eating. For sure. I'm, I don't tend to take a breath in between my knife and fork going into my mouth and putting it on the plate, which I know is something that I could easily do. Yeah. So we know that there's a huge variability in people's eating speed. And when we're looking at how we can change behavior, the first thing is, is do people actually vary? Because if we all do it the same way, then perhaps actually it's going to be difficult to change. I know when I sit down at the dinner table, I eat at half the speed, so I take twice as long as my husband takes. He wolfs it down, he goes and gets seconds, goes and gets third. Now, why is that a problem? Well, first, he's not going to like the fact that I've just pulled him out on this. That's a problem. But the reason it's a problem is because we know that if you eat too fast, lots of different things are happening in your body. So firstly, your food hasn't reached your intestine, which is where all of these receptors to do with how hungry you feel, how full you feel are stimulated. And so it takes nearly maybe 10 to 20 minutes for these receptors to actually be stimulated by the food that you're eating in order to say, hey, Sarah, you've eaten enough now. I'm full. You don't need any more food like stop your eating. If you're Mm -hmm. eating really quickly, you haven't given your food a chance to get to these receptors to feed back to say you're full. Additionally, what happens is is when you eat more slowly, you have stretch receptors in your stomach 
that respond to this and slow down the rate at which your food is emptying from your stomach. So you have this more sustained stimulation of fullness as well. And so what we know from work that we've done at Zoe with our predict trials, but also other published work, we know that if you're that slow eater, like I am versus that fast eater, like my husband or you are, that typically on average, those people have differences in terms of their body mass index, so how overweight they are or their weight. They have differences in their cardiometabolic disease risk. So by this, I mean their type 2 diabetes risk, their cardiovascular disease risk. And we know that fast eaters tend to be a higher weight than slower eaters. We know that they tend to have a higher risk of cardiovascular disease, of type 2 diabetes. And then there's some fascinating studies where they've actually asked people to slow down the rate that they're eating, and then asked another group of people to continue eating at the same rate and looked at how that's impacted health as well. And I think that's what is really interesting. That is. And when you're saying that they have a higher rate of maybe type 2 diabetes or cardiovascular disease, is that because they've maybe got more visceral fat as well around their dominant? And is that where the link maybe comes in too? I think it comes from a couple of places. I think it firstly comes from the fact that people are eating more. And Mm. we know that. We know that fast eaters have a higher energy intake. We know that again from our own Zoe research that fast eaters eat about 120 more calories a day versus slow eaters. We also know, and again from our own research, that people that eat more quickly have a higher blood sugar response, so a higher increase in circulating blood glucose after that meal than those people that are eating the meal more slowly. So even independent or in addition to the effect that a higher body weight and visceral fat has on these diseases like type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, we also know that we have um, an unfavorable metabolic response as well, which over time will predispose you as well to cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. As you were talking about the eating rate, I was trying to think about the food that I eat quickly and the ones that I would eat more slowly. And when I'm having, you know, a whole food dinner, I have to eat that more slowly because I've got to chew my food more. But if I'm grabbing something or it's an ultra processed food, I feel you're more likely to have that quickly. Is that true? Is there any like research in the area that shows that? So there's been a great study that looked at how fast you eat, depending on how much the food is processed. And what they found is if you eat heavily processed, ultra processed foods, you eat those foods 50% more quickly than if you eat minimally processed foods. And interesting in that study, this study actually matched the foods for nutrients. So they were identical fat, protein, fiber, and carbohydrate. All that was different was that one was heavily processed and one was unprocessed. And the heavily processed were eaten 50% more quickly. It resulted in an increase in energy intake of 200 more calories per day as well. And then there's some other research that's been conducted where they've looked at just the texture of food and how the texture of food impacts your energy intake and your eating rate. And what they see is that the texture of food can modify both your eating rate, so how fast you're eating it, as well as your energy intake. And so there's studies that have modified the texture of food and found that it results in a 30% difference in the speed that you eat by changing it from this kind of quite hard to a soft texture. And that results as well in a 20% difference in energy intake at that meal when people are left kind of free living to choose how much they want to have. Wow. Isn't it mad that just these small things have such a big impact? And actually, it's these unconscious choices that we're making. You know, we're maybe unaware, as you said, of the food choices that we're we're driving towards. They're actually having, you know, up to 200 extra calories a day on eating speed is a, is a, is a big difference from person to person. And Sarah, what's really interesting as well is I think it's a really simple... Um, strategy that we can all do if we are know we're fast eaters. And so research has shown that if you're a fast eater and you slow down the rate that you're eating by 20%, which actually isn't huge, that you can reduce your energy intake in that at that meal by 15%. And that's by actually doing very little. And there's different ways you can do it. You can put your knife and fork down between each mouthful just to kind of as a way of pausing. There's also interestingly gadgets out there that you can buy. And I'm not suggesting anyone does that, but this is what's used in research. There's something called a mandometer, which is this kind of scale that you can put your plate on. And if it detects that your food is being removed too quickly, this alarm goes off and buzzes at you to slow down. 
And when it, this has, this mandometer has been used in trials, it shows a reduction in energy intake when no other guidance is given of about 15 uh, percent, which is really interesting. There's also these smart forks out there that again, um, vibrate, um, and light up if it detects that you're eating the food too quickly. I'm not suggesting people go and buy these gadgets. I actually think just putting your knife and fork down between, you know, every few mouthfuls is the, the, a great way to achieve that. But again, it's a really simple way without actually changing anything really can actually, if you're wanting to reduce your energy intake for those that are wanting to, mm -hmm. can naturally uh, reduce it subconsciously. Well, I just, th I mean, I firstly want that last gadget of a lighting up knife and fork. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's inflatable ones as well that have been used in research that I only inflate to be hard enough to be able to pick up your food at certain uh, intervals. So I think it's like every 30 seconds. So that then it deflates and it's too floppy to pick up uh, food. <laughs> the things that people do in research. I think when I host my next dinner party, I'm going to lay the table with inflatable <laughs> knives and forks and just see what people's reaction is. Just do a <laughs> trial on the table and see how people react. Anyone listening, that, I'd yeah. love that for Christmas. <laughs> but it, it's those, isn't it interesting? It's like those really simple changes. And it makes me, it reminds me of my grandfather who would still be sitting at the dinner table an hour later and we'd all be finishing. And he'd just be talking constantly that he never had time to eat. And I'm just thinking it's even those simple things, people that might be living at home, it's quite hard to eat slowly because sometimes we're just on our own thinking and wolfing our food down. But actually having those moments when we're going out for dinner or seeing friends are really good moments to start testing this, to start engaging more on conversation and actually not wolfing our food down, which is kind of what I normally do when I'm on my own or out. So I think yeah. it's just a really good, simple reminder for people to do that. And I think it's a real problem with how we're now all living and working our lives. Firstly, the way that mm -hmm. many of us are living such rushed lives. Many of us are working at home and maybe wolfing our, our food down while we're taking a Zoom meeting or something. Or we're eating in front of the TV and we know that people that are distracted and eating in front of the television tend to eat more quickly and tend to therefore consume more calories as well. And so it's a real reminder of the importance of more mindful eating and also mm -hmm. bringing back the sociable way that we have traditionally, if you live in a, a, a setting that allows you to, to eat with your family or your friends, for example. Mm. It's a big thing. I think that's something that we can learn from the French is that I remember when I was living there, they would always have these hour and a half lunch breaks. Without doubt, they'd always go for lunch and sit down. Whereas I kind of think about how I structure my day and sometimes I'm, I'm grab and go and so many of us will grab mm -hmm. a sandwich and we'll be walking along the road. And I think even just hearing as you're saying it, it's just like reciting all of these kind of small unconscious habits that we're trying to pack into our day to actually just take a moment for ourselves. And I can imagine that also will have a bigger impact as well, you know, on like indigestion and things like that and a broader context of just how we're digesting our food. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that also goes back not just to the speed that we're eating, but the kind of foods that encourage us to eat more quickly. So these softer, mm. more processed foods versus the whole foods that have the harder texture. And there, there's a phrase that I heard someone once say, and I'm afraid I can't remember who this is to credit it to, but actually if we could bring the crunch back to our lunch we would be a lot healthier because we would not only be eating better food, but we'd be eating it more slowly um, and we'd therefore also be reducing um, our energy intake. Yeah, I mean, that whole that's just where the fibre kind of analogy comes in for me when you're mentioning that, the crunch, which is so, so important. And it makes me just want to come on to something that I think really intertwines with the speed of what we're eating and more mindful eating, which is snacks, because they take up, 25% of our energy intake just from snacking. Now there's kind of a, a big discussion around snacks. Should we be snacking? Should we not be snacking? Are we having too many snacks and not letting our microbes sit and relax? You know, are we constantly in a feeding environment? And then if we are snacking, what types of snacks should we be reaching for? And I know that this is very much like there's a study that came out for you guys today around snacks as well and how we should be looking at this. So I'd love for you to divulge your research from Zoe on where currently are we sitting on the conversation surrounding snacks? 
I'm going to let you in on a natural remedy that I use to calm the mayhem of modern life. And it's really helped improve my sleep quality. It's the functional mushrooms Bloomin have created, which I use daily. And I'm so confident from how well they've worked for me. Bloomin are giving away a thousand free samples if you use the code LWBW1000 at checkout. In a recent randomized, double blind, and placebo controlled study, patients with neurosthenia, a condition characterized by fatigue, headaches, and irritability, were treated with reishi mushrooms. After eight weeks, they all recorded significantly lower scores for fatigue and an improved sense of well-being. And before you think shrooms, no, they don't get you high and they don't taste anything like mushroom. And for you to try for yourself, Bloomin are giving away a thousand free samples of the mushroom powder when you use the code LWBW1000 at checkout. Just head to bloomin.co.uk and get your first Bloomin product completely free. There's also links in the show notes. Yeah, well, I'm very excited to talk about snacks today because we just had a paper out um, published in the European Journal of Nutrition all around snacking. Um, Congratulations. Thank you. There's actually very little known about snacking. There's very Mm. little research. Now, this is partly because... What is a snack? Is it an eating event between a meal or is it around the actual product? There isn't actually a agreed definition on a snack. When we talk about snacking and when I'm talking about snacking to you today, I'm not talking about a particular food. I'm going to be talking about an eating event between a main meal. So when we consume anything between our breakfast, our lunch or our dinner, that's what we constitute um, as a snack. And what we know from our own research, which actually agrees with what little there is published around snacking, is that we consume anywhere between 20 to 30% of our energy from snacks in the UK. Now, this compares to like Southern European countries where they consume around 10% of their energy uh, from snacks. We also know typically, and again, I'm starting by talking about average, but then we need to delve into the different types of snackers. Typically, the snacks that people consume in the UK are higher in saturated fat, higher in refined carbohydrates, so particularly sugar, they're lower in fiber, and they're lower in high quality protein. So we also mm-hmm. know the types of snacks that people eating aren't great. And we know that about three quarters of the foods that we snack on in the UK from our own research are what we would consider unhealthy foods. These are foods that are heavily processed unhealthy foods according to certain classifications. What our research tried to do is actually separate out really important questions to do with snacking that you've also just raised. Is snacking itself, i.e. having multiple eating events throughout the day bad for us, Or is it just all about the kind of foods that we're snacking on? Are there optimal foods to snack on? And is there optimal times of day to snack on? And so what we first try to look at is, does it really matter how many times you eat through the day? So we call this kind of pattern like a grazing pattern. So rather than your very traditional breakfast, lunch and dinner pattern, people are continually picking, which I'm one of those. I get hungry or hangry and then I couldn't be sitting here, Sarah, having not had breakfast. Otherwise, I'd be talking nonsense. So well done to you. (laughs) And what we know, actually, is that the act of snacking, so having multiple eating events itself isn't a problem. It's the type of snacks that people are having. That's the problem. So if we look at people that have a similar diet quality, so overall healthfulness of their diet, some snack a lot. So some have lots of eating events, this grazing pattern, and some just have their three main meals. The association with health is no different. Okay. But if we then look at the quality of the snacks, that's when it becomes important. Now it might seem obvious, but actually no one's looked at this before. No one's actually said, What's important here doesn't matter how many times you're consuming meals throughout the day. It really does flip the head on the table around the debate, doesn't it? Because we are told sometimes to not snack and to just have our three main meals a day. But I guess what you're saying is actually, no, it's fine to snack. But when you do make those good choices, 
which from what I want to say is, from speaking from Dan Butner, something that really stood out from the Blue Zones was nuts, was a really great snack to kind of have in your eye line. And I know that you speak a lot about nuts and, and the benefits of, of that. So I'm just trying to think about some healthy snacks that people can start thinking about to have in their eye line. But is there any way that we can start thinking about this in how we have it throughout our day? So if we're thinking about when we should stop eating, saying we're having our dinner, should we then not be having snacks after dinner? Is there any kind of correlation there towards health as well? Or is it that actually snacks are fine and we can just continuously snack throughout the day and and into the evening? So I think a couple of points to pick up on there are, one is that I don't want to suggest that everyone can just go and eat endlessly throughout the day. I would suggest people listen to their hunger signals. And for those like myself that do have the signals that are telling me, I, Sarah, I want some more food. I think that our data shows that there's no harm in having regular snacking events or eating events throughout the day, as long as it's on the right food. I mm-hmm. think that the timing though is really important. And this is where we have some really interesting results as well. So what we found is that 30% of people snack after nine o'clock. I was actually surprised myself. Now, I am a late night snacker, but I thought I was a a bit of a freak out there snacking so late. I was surprised that nearly, you know, a third of people are snacking after nine. And what we found is when we separated out those people that snack after nine versus those that have a similar amount of snacks in the day, but snack earlier than nine, we found that regardless of how high quality their snacks were, people snacking at after nine had worst health outcomes. So they had a higher body fat, they had higher risk uh, of, of having some of these factors related to cardiovascular disease. Now, Sarah, this is cross-sectional analysis. So this is um, analysis that we did at one point in time. So it doesn't show the causal link, but actually we had a large number of participants. We had a thousand participants. So it's a really good glimpse into what we think is going on here. It's just interesting, isn't it, as we're kind of talking through this research, just kind of saying, okay, if we're going to start changing one thing about snacks, the quality of snacks and not snacking after nine seems to be, from your latest research, the way to go, as opposed to kind of thinking of banishing all snacks. If there's simple things people can do, I guess that's the steps to do it. So when you're advising or when you're looking at snacks, what snacks were distributed in these studies or what are the ones that you would say are the shining stars if people are going to start implementing this into their day-to-day life? What would you advise on the snack front? So you've already mentioned this. I would definitely advise nuts. That isn't just because I've spent loads of my career researching nuts, but there's good evidence to show that Nuts as a snack improve health. And we actually ran a study at King's a couple of years ago uh, called the Attis study. And in this study, we randomly allocated people to swap out their normal snacks for either nuts or have a very controlled snack that we designed that was kind of typical of the UK snacks. And we asked people to change 20% of their energy, because we know that 20% of our energy in the UK comes from snacks, to either be almond nuts or to be these typical uh, UK snacks that we gave in the form of muffins for six weeks. And then we looked uh, before and after at a whole different host of health outcomes. And what we found is by maintaining everything else the same, so these people were told, don't change anything else, carry on everything else the same, just change your snacks. By just changing their snacks, the people that were having the almond nuts improved their blood lipid profile. So by this, I mean their cholesterol, so particularly their bad cholesterol. They improved a measure of blood vessel function that we've been using at King's called um, flow-mediated dilation that measures the functioning of the lining of the blood vessels. And we saw a huge improvement. And that's really exciting because we know that damage to the lining of the vessels is the first underlying pathology in heart disease. And actually, we saw this to be massively improved versus the others. And then we also saw an improvement in something called heart rate variability, which is quite a novel marker of cardiovascular health and is emerging to be a very strong measure of how healthy uh, your cardiovascular system is. And that was by changing nothing else. So we've already come up with a couple of what I think are really impactful, but small changes that already, hopefully, Sarah, you're going to eat your meals a bit more slowly tomorrow. And now I know you're already eating nuts, but for those that, you know, do like some particularly unhealthy snacks, if you could swap to some healthy snacks like nuts will improve your health. And something else that was really, I was actually really surprised by from the paper that we've brought out today is we looked at 
the quality of people's snacks versus the quality of their typical diet. Mm. So we separated out how healthy are your snacks versus how healthy is the rest of your diet, not including your snacks. Now, I'd assume that if you generally eat healthy meals, you're generally going to eat healthy snacks or vice mm. versa. But actually, we found that that wasn't the case and that 45% of people were what we call discordant for the quality of their foods. Now, what I mean by this is 44% of people that were having super healthy breakfast, lunches and dinners were actually eating really unhealthy snacks or vice versa. You know, 45% of people that were having really unhealthy main meals were actually having healthy snacks. And so that's really important because that's saying, okay, there's 45% of people are probably working really hard on making sure their main meals are really healthy. But then they're just going and ruining it all by going and reaching for that unhealthy snack. And I, I was really surprised by that. And I, I think that's something for me as a scientist and someone that's worked in nutrition research is, yeah, a real eye opener to not to assume, <laughs> um, you know, what, what drives people's dietary habits. Well, it's so true. I think about that when I see people go to the gym and then I see them come out and eat, I don't know, a Mars bar or, you know, a muffin or whatever. And I think, oh, you've just worked really hard. And now you're having something to refuel your body, which isn't actually that beneficial for you. So it's interesting because they're obviously like very big gym people, but the the type of snack they're having after to refuel actually is not going to be supporting them. So it's it's interesting that you mention it. And when you think about it in that way, I don't think anyone breaks it down to actually the percentage of our energy intake that comes from snacks. Because I would be thinking before we had this conversation, well, it's only a small minority. So actually it doesn't matter. It's a really small percentage, but actually like putting it out there and saying it's up to 30% of our energy intake, it's actually a massive bulk. So I think that's why, you know, the research that you've, you've said today and that's come out today is actually really important for us all to listen to. Because as you said, even before we start thinking about our three main meals a day, just looking at the snacks. And that's how we can have a lot more autonomy, I think, on what we're buying. Because if we have those healthy snacks in our eye line, then we're more likely to have those healthy choices. There's less energy on us to make a whole meal, which is more exhausting to think about changing than just those smaller habits of what are the healthy ones that we can put in our eye line or pack in our bag for the day that stops us having that quick, you know, grab and go from, you know, something that we're walking past. So I think it does make a massive difference, but sometimes we're just unconsciously snacking as well. And so it's all of these like unconscious moments I'm starting to realize within nutrition are the ones that actually have sometimes the biggest outcomes. I have a favor to ask. 74% of people that watch this podcast haven't hit subscribe and 15% haven't hit the bell to turn on notifications. I want this podcast to reach as many people as possible to keep sharing expert information and powerful stories to improve your life. So if you've ever enjoyed my podcast, please hit the subscribe button and turn on notifications. Doing this small favor will really help me. Thank you. Yeah, and I think you made a really valuable point there as well about it's something that's very easy to change. I think mm. depending on your circumstances, for, for me though, as a mother, it's really difficult for me to change my evening meal because yeah. actually it's driven by my children's preferences largely because mm -hmm. maybe I'm too soft and give in, but <laughs> I don't have total autonomy really over my lunch because it depends on you know, am I eating with other people in the office, etc. I don't have total autonomy over my dinner. There's two places most people have total autonomy, breakfast and snacks. And for communities or populations where they actually make a large contribution to their energy intake, I think rather than hyper-focusing in on, you know, a particular vegetable at your lunch or dinner, why not make some simple changes to those two areas that account for a huge component of our calories, your breakfast and your snacks? And what's really interesting is actually if you look as well at different populations in different countries, the different amount of energy that comes from snacks, breakfast, lunch and dinners is hugely different. And I think that this is really fascinating because I think as well, you talked about, you know, your recent podcast around the blue zones, for example, in those kind of areas, they actually don't snack much. They actually don't have huge breakfasts. So they don't have a, a large percent energy from breakfast. But for the most of these countries, the majority of their energy is coming at lunchtime. 
Mm. And then although they might eat later in the evening, as you know, is very typical in Mediterranean countries, that's actually accounting for one of their smallest meals of the day. Yet if you go to Northern Europe, nearly 50% of our energy intake is coming from snacks and from breakfast. So these two eating events that are often done in isolation that we have autonomy over. The next biggest eating event is dinner. And actually that one of the smallest eating events is lunch. And that brings everything around time of day as well, um, you know, into the whole equation. So talking about breakfast, which you've mentioned can take up to 25% of our energy intake. And for those breakfast eaters that are listening, let's start there because there's a big conversation at the moment where a lot of people are aware of their blood sugar. A lot of people are starting to wear more blood glucose monitors and the importance of not having too many spikes throughout our day. And I want to get on to the dips, which is when our blood sugar dips too much. And you're going to explain that for us a bit more in depth. But let's start at our breakfast because this is basically our first eating window throughout the day. And we know from your research that actually this can really be a determinant of how we feel throughout the day, but also how this kind of controls our response to that food and maybe the other choices that we make. So how does our blood glucose and breakfast go hand in hand and how can we be looking at this? Yeah, so I think that's a couple of really key topics to pick up on, particularly around the blood glucose. But what we've shown is what you have for breakfast can impact your responses to lunch. So we did a study where we randomly allocated people over a couple of weeks to have different carbohydrate rich breakfasts, but everyone had exactly the same lunch. Now, there was one particular breakfast that resulted in people having a higher blood glucose response to this standardized lunch versus the other breakfast when everything else was the same. So they were having the same lunch, but they were having a hugely different blood glucose response that was because of them having a different breakfast. And so this shows the importance of starting off your day in the correct way so that you're not on a roller coaster throughout the day. And the reason I talk about roller coaster is because we know your blood glucose response is very complex and we can dive into this if you want in a minute. And so you want to start your day so that you're on a very gentle roller coaster. So, you know, the caterpillar roller coaster that you get rather than one of these like scary up and down roller coasters. Because how you respond to your breakfast impacts your metabolic responses, like I've just said to your to your lunch. It impacts your mood, your energy, your hunger, and your energy intake throughout the rest of the day. And we've seen this from our own research. So what are the breakfasts that people should be eating to avoid, as you said, the blood glucose, big kind of rises and dips that happen quite quickly? What should we be aiming for for our breakfast? So I think it's really important to say to everyone that uh, a rise in blood glucose is a normal physiological response to eating any kind of carbohydrate. It's not just following eating sugar. So any kind of uh, carbohydrate, even the most healthy carbohydrates are going to cause a rise in blood glucose. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to flatten the curve because it's normal to have that. But what we don't want to do is have really excessive peaks, excessive dips, excessive fluctuations throughout the day. And so in order to do that, adding more fiber, adding more protein, adding more healthy fats into our breakfast is a really great way to then prevent a very big peak at breakfast and a very big uh, dip. Uh, as well after. And this is because we know, therefore, it stops you going on that roller coaster throughout the day. And what's really interesting is that when we look at blood glucose throughout the day, there's lots of different features that we can look at. We can look at how big a peak is after a meal. We can look at how much it varies throughout the day, how much it fluctuates. We can look at how big the dip is as well a couple of hours after the meal. Now, each of those features tell us something slightly different. So for example, people have a really big peak. We know that initiates a cascade of quite unfavorable downstream health effects, ultimately resulting in inflammation, which we know increases our risk of many chronic diseases like type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease. But we've got some very novel research that's looked at the dips that many people experience two to four hours after having very highly refined carbohydrates as well. And we've also looked at how people that have dips after breakfast, how that impacts their health. So 
I'm just thinking about a typical English breakfast. It's a piece of toast. So it would be changing it from a white piece of toast, maybe to a whole grain piece of toast yep. and maybe smashing some avocado on there. We've got some good healthy fats. And I mean, if you are, you know, want to be extra, extra healthy, maybe a sprinkle of some seeds or something like that on top and some olive oil. So you've got a good mixture and your food combining there to help reduce those kind of excessive peaks of inflammation. Is that how people could be approaching their breakfast going forward? That might be a bit more helpful for them. Yeah, I think that's a great example. So you're getting fiber in there, you're getting healthy fats, you're getting healthy protein as well. You're not just having, you know, a big carbohydrate rush. But I think this is really important as well to pick up on how we need to, though, not just think about this in terms of nutrients. So mm. you've actually suggested what's an incredibly healthy meal from a kind of whole food perspective. Now, I could also initiate the exact same blood glucose response from keeping my white bread, putting lashings of butter on, sticking a bit of bacon in there and a fried egg. Now, your meal that you suggested versus the meal that I just suggested for breakfast would cause exactly the same blood glucose response. But obviously, one is a lot healthier than the other. And I think this is really important just to pause on this for a moment to say that when we think about blood glucose, we must remember it's not the only feature of health that's important. And the reason I think it's important to say, say this is the discussion uh, in the nutrition and health community around continuous glucose monitoring. So where you can wear a sensor that monitors your glucose over a couple of weeks continuously, the conversation is growing um, and the debate around this is growing. And the reason is, is because there are many people that are seeing it as, you know, the one feature of health that matters but it's one piece of a huge, huge puzzle. And we need to um, remember that. We need to think about it in the context of everything else. And so if I was only glucose orientated, I would think, well, that bacon, butter, you know, white sandwich is just as healthy as this avocado, olive oil, whole grain breakfast that you uh, suggested. Well, we all know that that's not the case. Mm. And therefore, it's really important that whilst I think the blood glucose is a really important um, and interesting thing to look at, it's just one of many pieces of the puzzle related to our health. It's like a large mosaic, isn't it? And it's, it's different parts of those puzzles and it's really multifactorial. And I guess, you know, it's one of those things that if we can actually just start to think about also recognising how we're feeling when we're eating, I think that's such a good dom dominator of how we are doing ourselves because we can have as much information out there. But if we're not feeling great when we're trying to change these responses to our food or trying to change our diet, then it's the best indicator that we've got really. And I think sometimes we can get so bogged down into other things that are telling us what we should be doing as opposed to actually connecting back to ourselves and thinking, how do I feel? And I think the reason why I find blood glucose really interesting is because you mentioned there earlier that it really links to our mood. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes we can get, you know, so frustrated on why we're feeling maybe a bit of brain fog or, or low energy. And sometimes it's the simplest things, as you said, by starting off by just actually trying to understand these small factors that have such a big part. And I'm always so interested in how we're feeling related to food. And I think it is such a big common denominator. Yeah, I think that the glucose dips is a really great example, actually, to feed into what you've said, which is where we can see physiologically what's happening as well as feel what's happening. And so we published some research where we looked at people who were dippers versus those that weren't. So we found that 25% of people after consuming uh, carbohydrate rich meals have this big dip in their blood glucose response about two to four hours after having a meal. And then we found that there was people kind of sitting in the middle and then 25% of people who just have no dip whatsoever. And what we found is those people that typically dip after having high carbohydrate meals um, have a higher energy intake. So at their next meal, they consume 80 calories more at their next meal. They consume a total of 320 calories more over the day. They are feel less alert, they have lower mood and they have uh, lower energy and they feel more hungry more quickly. Now, the reason that's interesting is because 
our bodies are really clever at adapting to our energy intake. So whilst we might think, okay, a dip causes you to have a bit more food at the next meal. What's interesting is that over the whole day, it results in this 320 calorie difference. Typically, we, we're quite clever. Our, our physiological systems are quite clever at kind of adjusting our hunger, etc., so that we jet, tend to have quite consistent energy intake over the day. That's quite huge, I think. And then some really interesting research that's hot off the press is that we went a step further with this research. So we know that we don't just differ between who we are. So i.e., my mm-hmm. response versus your response, Sarah. But we also know we differ day to day. So how you respond to something one day versus how you respond to something the next day is also hugely different. And we also know the food choices you make day to day are going to be different. And so what we found was that if we separated days within a person based on when they had a dipping day or a non-dipping day. So let's say you chose a breakfast that was like your avocado, olive oil, seed breakfast that caused no dip. Okay. Mm -hmm. But let's say the other day you didn't have the avocado or the olive oil, but you just had a lot more bread. So you had um, a, a more carbohydrate rich breakfast that caused a bigger dip. What we would see is on the day that you have the breakfast that causes a bigger dip, that that day you would feel more hungry throughout the day, not just after the next meal. That day you would have a reduction in energy intake and that also you would go on to have an extra 160 calories at your next meal. And so that's even within the same person. And that's a really great way, I think, of showing just making the right choice at breakfast has this mm-hmm. immediate effect and stops you on that roller coaster of hunger, low energy, low mood, etc. Is our body recognising it if it's done in a smoothie form in the same way or even a meal replacement? I'm so happy that we've teamed up with Bloomin for this season of the podcast to claim your free month of natural mushroom-based supplements. Head to bloomin.co.uk and use the code LWBW1000 to try it for free. There is a link in the show notes. I need to come back and talk a whole hour about that because that takes me on to my favourite topic, which is the food (laughs) matrix. We know that the structure of food is so, so important. So we talked about it a little bit in relating to the texture earlier. But actually, when I came on to this podcast, I think a couple of years ago, we dived into a little bit to do with how important food structure is. And in science, we call this food matrix. And I think food matrix, food structure, is a great example of how we have to move beyond a very reductionist way of thinking about food, that it's not Mm -hmm. just a simple list of nutrients, you know, fat, protein, fiber, carbohydrate. It's not even about the ingredients. So smoothies is a great segue into this where actually you could have a smoothie that is identical in terms of both ingredients and nutrients, and then you could have the whole foods on the side. So the smoothie might be, um, let's say, some berries, a little bit of yogurt, some seeds, and um, some orange juice, for example. Or you could have all of that, but in its whole form where you've got the orange as a whole, you've got the berries as a whole. Now, these are identical nutritional ingredients, but how you metabolize those foods is quite different. And we've know this from the our own research that we have done what happens is is it changes the speed at which you metabolize and so i like to use the analogy as it's changing a slow food when you have it in its whole structure its original form into a fast food when you're actually liquidizing it now these are really healthy ingredients that i we we i yeah. just mentioned here so i'm not saying they're bad for you i still think that that's you know healthy however What is even healthier is to have it in its original form, because what that will do is it will slow down the rate at which your stomach empties. It will increase some of these uh, fullness signals that are coming back to your brain. So you're less likely to overeat it uh, rather than glugging quickly that smoothie down. Mm. It will cause a slower, more sustained um, and less high increase in blood glucose. And you're also a lot less likely to get that dip as well after. So it means you'll feel full for longer. It means that you're also less likely to have some of these kind of sugar crashes, as we call it, where you can get the low mood, the low alertness, the brain fog. 
as well. God, I'm so glad we went on to that because it really does encompass actually so much about what we spoke about, about the eating speed. I mean, I yep. definitely do not drink a smoothie slowly because I'm like, it's so Moorish that I do literally wolf yep. it down. Glug it. So you've got to eat. I literally am glugging it. So it's interesting because it's like the eating speed is super quick with that. As you mentioned, there's no chewing involved. So it's not actually helping my satiety at all. And it's something that I've probably not really registered that I've had that much food because it was quite quick. So I'm actually, you know, probably going to crave more food. And then lastly, as you said, it's, um, it's the response afterwards. You know, you're going to probably have a higher glucose response. And for that, probably going to eat more throughout the day. So it's just interesting when I'm actually thinking about how we've kind of formulated our conversation today. And I've obviously just had this kind of aha moment about smoothies that is delicious and healthy or can be healthy, but actually is a really good overarching example of just how much food can really be effective and also ineffective in like the rest of our eater patterns throughout the day. Yeah, I think it brings together the factors that we've talked about. So it brings together eating speed, also factors related to the food matrix, the the glucose dips as well. So yeah, great example. I mean, we're going to have to do more on the food matrix in another podcast, but I was saying anyone listening to this who's like, what is the food matrix? We did a whole episode when we came to your house. It was about, yeah, a year and a half ago now. And I put it on the TikTok. And honestly, it was one of my fastest growing TikToks ever. I don't think people could understand how an almond can be metabolized in different forms. So go and check that one out. Um, it's a few seasons back. I every week put up who's coming on the show and my fantastic listeners and community all write in and we had an abundance of questions for you, Sarah. And this one kind of stood out to me as well. And John Haynes wants to know about whether having apple cider vinegar really does help with blood sugar um, or blood glucose, as you put it. Um, and does lemon do the same job too? And I guess I'm seeing this a lot on social media now. So I thought, let's just have this out on the podcast and and figure out fact or fiction. Sarah, tell us the truth. Oh, there's a bit of fact amongst a bit of the fiction, I must say. I do need to say that I haven't researched this myself. I don't, I'm not 100% up to speed with the literature on apple cider vinegar. The last time I looked into what evidence there was with a big dose of scepticism, actually, I was a little bit surprised that there is some evidence to support this. So there is some evidence to show that if you do have apple cider vinegar with a carbohydrate rich meals, yes, it does reduce the size of your glucose response. And so something, though, that I think is important to remember alongside that is about the pleasure. So people are doing this and saying, oh my gosh, I'm having to glug this apple cider vinegar. It's awful, but it doesn't matter. It's reducing my blood glucose. Well, just remember blood glucose, like I said earlier, is one piece of the puzzle. And secondly, food is to be enjoyed. Our meals are there to give us pleasure. They're so important that we remember that. And if drinking that apple cider vinegar is really quite horrific for you, I just don't think it's worth it. (laughs) It's going to have a small impact in some people. It might have no impact on other people. It might have a big impact for you as an individual, but actually surely there's other ways, like the kind of things that we've talked about. Slow down the rate of eating. That's going to reduce your blood sugar peak. Make sure there's lots of fiber in the meal or protein. Think about the ordering in which you're eating your food. And this is another thing you can think about, making sure maybe the first bit of food you have of the meal is particularly high in the fiber, fat or protein so that already your stomach is actually slowing its rate of gastric emptying before you've kind of started eating the carbohydrate. Mm. As for the second part of that, lemon juice, I have to put my hands up and say I have absolutely no idea. Um, And I say that with confidence because... I finally reached a stage in my academic career the last year or so that I realized actually a good scientist is proud to say what they don't know. And I don't know the answer to that. We can't know the answer to everything. (laughs) I'm so pleased that you said that rather than just trying to fab an answer that, again, might not be correct. And I completely agree. The amount of times on here where I get asked a question and it's like, gosh, do I have enough science to back that up? Probably not. So I'll, I'll pass on it. So I'm really pleased that you did. You do feel a bit sometimes like, oh, I should know everything. And actually, we can't. And you do know a heck of a lot, Sarah Berry. Um, so <laughs> I, I mean, don't feel it. 
You do, you do. It's imposter syndrome. Um, but I love that you said that. And actually, one, the only other caveat I want to put in on that question for John is think about your teeth because I had to go to the dentist this week because one of my teeth fell out at the back. And I honestly believe that sometimes having these really high patent things like apple cider vinegar or too much sugar or anything does really harm your teeth. And sometimes we think about only health aspect, but dental health is a huge indicator of our health as well. And I'm sure glugging back acidic vinegar every day into our mouth with our teeth is not going to be the most beneficial. So as you said, bigger picture is probably the way to go here. I know a number of people who have tried this and every one of them that has tried it said, oh my God, sir, it's disgusting. I'm like, just don't do it. Just disgusting. Come on. Life's too short. It's really not going to extend your life long enough to warrant that, in my opinion. <laughs> and I just say about the other things we spoke about, it's honestly so true. Sometimes we do the most extreme things. Yeah, as you said, these really healthy eaters are then actually undoing it all with a really unhealthy snack. Just change the snack and that might actually have a more favorable effect on your health. You know, that's a great point. So we've touched on how, yeah, you know, focusing so much on healthy eating, but then eating it late at night, which we know isn't good, then also having the unhealthy snacks. And we haven't even touched yet on the other aspects which are related to, you know, your fasting period, the timing of eating, whether you should eat your food earlier in the day, later in the day. All of that also impacts how you respond to food without even changing the types of food that you're having. That's a big one. And I know that you mentioned, actually, sometimes it's not always having to do the 16 hour fasting window that, you know, a lot of people discuss even doing something yep. as a 14 hour or 12 hour yep. can have as much as of an impact on your health. Yeah. So we've recently completed a study called the Big If Study, the Big Intermittent Fasting Study, where we had 150,000 people. I think we had just started this when we did our podcast with you last year. You and Tim were at my house and you were like, we've just started this. And I was like, yes, Let's bring you back on the show. Live while we work exclusive, Sarah Berry, go. So in our big intermittent fasting study, the largest intermittent fasting study to date, we had 150,000 people that signed up to do this. And this was a really interesting study because we know from really tightly controlled clinical trials that if you increase your fasting period, so you reduce your eating window, we know that that improves your metabolic health, it improves your inflammatory responses, it improves your weight. So you have a weight reduction, you reduce your energy intake. We know that, but this is done in studies where people are put on quite extreme regimes of, oh, only in a six hour window, which is blimmin' miserable, I think, in my opinion, mm. but in these very tightly controlled clinical settings. So we ran this big if study where we wanted to look in the way that people live their lives, in the noisy way that people live their lives, where they've got all of these other factors going on. Does reducing your eating window, so increasing your fasting period, actually improve how you feel? Does it improve your health? And so we asked everyone, look, don't go extreme. You find a way that works for you to reduce your eating window to 10 hours. You have a 14 hour fast period, whether it means you delay your breakfast or whether it means you just eat your evening meal a bit earlier, do it how it fits in with your life. We're not going to prescribe it to you. And what we found is that when people went from their typical eating window and reduced it down, even by just two hours, we saw that people felt better. And this is what I love because I spent my entire research career in nutrition science always measuring blood and, and blood vessel function like we were talking about earlier. I never ask people how they feel because God forbid, mm -hmm. you know, I just want to know how has that biomarker changed. But in this study, it was a remote study. It was a very non-traditional study. And so we couldn't measure people's blood. But what we did is we asked them to record their weight and we asked them to say how hungry they're feeling each day, what their energy is like and what's their mood like. And we found just reducing by two hours, people felt less hunger, interestingly. They felt wow. more energy. And most importantly, I think this goes back to, I think, everything that your podcast stands for, their mood was better. They just felt better. And I love that. People did also lose weight. But to me, actually, these people were feeling better. And what was interesting as well, we found that people that practiced early time restricted eating, so that they were finishing their meals earlier in the day rather than eating late at night, they're the ones that had the maximum benefit. And we know this in terms of some of the biological markers that have been done in these tightly controlled settings, that if people eat uh, their, eat, if they have their eating window earlier in the day, they tend to have better improvements in cardiometabolic health. 
but people were feeling better. And I think that's so empowering. And again, it's a really simple strategy that actually, if you're happy to just eat your breakfast, you know, half an hour, an hour later, if you're happy to have your evening meal just half an hour, an hour earlier, then, you know, you will go on to improve your health, but most importantly, you'll go on to feel better as well. The feeling better is such a big thing, because as you said, like all of our conversation today, and I think we have really similar views on health that actually so much is around enjoyment. And there are things that we can do to kind of elevate that. But actually, there's no point putting yourself in a situation of health where you're stressed because you're trying to always optimize or feel like you're trying to change all of these different dominators. There's actually putting more stress on you as a person. And as you said, like the outcome of that big if study, the fact that they felt better and then also had all of these other benefits of health, Mm -hmm. just really go hand in hand. Because you're feeling better because you are in a better place. And I think that's such a big thing to acknowledge as opposed to, oh, okay, well, my blood glucose is now in a better state, but I've not really connected with how I'm feeling. And you're more likely, I guess, from that to actually carry that on because you want to do it. It doesn't feel like a burden. It feels an enjoyment. And so it's such a big thing. Whereas a lot of people, and we've had so many different people on here, like Dr. Sachin and Mindy Peltz all talk about intermittent fasting in their areas of you know, how they believe it should be kind of carried out different for men, different for women. Sachin's obviously researchers, you know, really linked to our circadian rhythms. But as you're saying, you know, even just shifting it by two hours can have a massive impact. And I think that's something that's really beautiful that's kind of come out of this. That Actually, we can probably all try and change that in some shape or form without being too extreme. Yeah. And what we ask people to do is do it according to how it fits with your life. Don't do it according to one of these very strict regimes. So if you are someone that, you know, desperately wants breakfast, if you're that kind of chronotype, then listen to your body, do do it that way. And if you allow people to make these changes or rather, sorry, encourage people to make these changes according to how it fits with their life, but also their choices, what they prefer, Mm. then they're going to be changes that might be small, but are sustainable and therefore mm-hmm. over life not have the huge impact than something that's really extreme and actually is quite blimmer miserable. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And that's the thing. We don't want to make it miserable. Now, I'm so keen to get this Apple bonus question, Sarah, because I know that I've cited it constantly throughout this. And it's something that I think is very much on the periphery of my mind with it coming up. I was actually asked earlier this year, what do you think is going to be a, a trend that's going to be rising up? And I said, actually, you know, continuous glucose monitors, I think, are starting to become a lot more in the public eye line. There's been a lot of discussion around like being coming obsessive around our blood glucose being this like perfectly straight flat line. People that are now buying these blood glucose monitors, what are the benefits aligned to it? But also what are the kind of detrimental health outcomes that are aligned to it as well if we're not using them correctly or if we're becoming too obsessed with them. There's not that much knowledge about how we should be using them. And actually, when do we need to kind of like tone down the use of them? If you want to listen to that, head over to Apple Podcasts now and subscribe to the Live Well, Be Well show. For now, Sarah, I have one more question for you. What does Live Well, Be Well mean to you? Um, Live Well, Be Well to me means being content, living a life of joy, and happiness in a healthy body. Yeah, I think that's what it means to me. I I think so many women at my age, I'm late 40s now, you know, we're always striving for something, whether it's we're Mm -hmm. perimenopausal, striving for a better body, striving for our careers. And I think, and I know you talk about this a lot, about just appreciating Mm -hmm. being where you are now. And I think, although it's very difficult for a lot of us to live in the moment, even if you can't necessarily live in the moment, just appreciating where you are and not striving for that perfect body, that perfect diet, that perfect career. But And maybe mm-hmm. that's what I think I mean by content. Be content yeah. with what you have. Yeah, fulfill the gratitude for what you've got at that moment. Yes. And it's, it's true, right? We ha- do actually have such a short life on this planet. And actually, if we're constantly striving towards that perfection of the future, which just does not ever exist, we're only going to be let down for disappointment. So it's actually just being like super thankful in that moment. And we know that actually does create better health comes because we actually live yeah. in the moment way more presently than we are- otherwise would do. So I'm completely with you on that one. It was so fun, so much richness in that. And I know that our listeners will gain, again, an immense amount. And, you know, I can't wait to post this on TikTok and just see what happens. 
Do you know what, Sarah? My 13-year-old daughter and my 11-year-old son that think that I'm the most boring mum in the world, maybe they'll actually listen to me if you put this on TikTok. They will. Honestly, you blew it up. So I'm, I'm getting ready for round <laughs> two. <laughs> Um, thank you so much and um, we're going to get you back on again I've got a quick question for you before you go are you ready to reset your health if you've been listening to my podcast or watching my YouTube channel for a while you'll know that I believe everyone's well-being journey is totally unique and it needs to be tailored to you But sometimes with all that important information out there it's tough to know what to listen to what to ignore or to prioritize how to make the best decision for you. It means taking that first step just gets put off, delayed or even ignored. But I'm here to help and I am so excited to offer you my 30 day mini course to help revitalize, restore and totally reset your health so you can discover the happiest of you. Your journey might include harnessing your breathwork and mindfulness game, changing up your diet for healthier meals, or simply improving your daily habits to be healthier and happier. Whatever your decision, my course is the perfect jumpstart you need, and you'll get access to the course for a one-off payment for just $14.99. Just click the link in the description or visit my website and I'll see you there. And by the way, I've got tons of videos for you in this channel and YouTube thinks that you'll like this one the most. So why don't you click on it now and give it a try? Thanks for listening.